400 years ago, a ship carrying more than 20 enslaved Africans arrived in Jamestown, Virginia, starting the long and painful history of slavery here in America. The New York Times Magazine is marking this anniversary with the groundbreaking 1619 Project. It's a collection of articles, essays, poems, and audio series that challenges us to rethink this dark history. Veteran journalist and writer Linda Villarosa is a contributor to the project, and she says myths about racial differences are still believed by doctors today, affecting the medical treatment that African Americans receive in some cases. And she sat down with our Walter Isaacson. This is an amazing journalistic project, the 1619 Project, about the time slavery began in America in the New York Times. Explain to me how it came about and what it's supposed to be doing. So 1619 was the year, in August 1619, actually, when the first enslaved person um, came to America in Jamestown, Virginia. So the project in The New York Times, it started as a magazine piece to look back at how slavery, um, 250 years of it, had uh, affected the structures of America and how they're still present in our everyday life. And so then it expanded beyond just the magazine to the newspaper and to the New York Times Daily podcast and to uh, as a curriculum for schools and school teachers to access. You're a health writer. So you write about things like the view of African Americans' health back then, but you even connect it to today. Tell me about, say, the lungs. So the lung um, issue is really interesting. There is a machine that is used in current uh, medical practice called a spirometer. So a couple of years ago, I had bronchitis, so my doctor was trying to see if I was getting better. So I breathed into this machine to study my lung capacity. So for this piece that I wrote in the 1619, I look back at the history of the spirometer. So the spirometer was used to prove that African Americans had inferior lungs to both justify slavery, but also to say slavery was beneficial to enslave people because all that exercise, the forced labor, was building up the lungs. So then I thought back to the present, and I thought, there's a race correction in the machine. And I'm wondering, did my doctor put in my race? Did this affect the treatment I got? Because the machine corrects for a uh, 10 to 15 percent, I guess you'd call it inferiority, in black people's lungs. And the idea that Samuel Cartwright, this doctor who really believed in the worst of race, racial myths, was the one who sort of set the stage for the use of this machine in America, and that the history has traveled through centuries, um, is alarming. But Thomas Jefferson does it as well. And Samuel Cartwright probably got his ideas from Thomas Jefferson. So in Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, which was really used to um, format laws and for guidance for the, you know, for the country at the time, if you read it, and it's a little bit of a throwaway what he says about the lungs, but it's in a passage about um, black, white uh, physiological differences. And though, obviously, Thomas Jefferson wasn't a physician, he was so influential that when people were reading this, they're like, oh, here's this thing about um, black people having inferior lungs. And so doctors in the South and scientists in the South picked up on this myth in order to justify um, the enslavement of people. And so it's really, if you look at that history, it's very strange and actually upsetting. How do you assess Jefferson when you look at all of this? So I have very mixed feelings about Thomas Jefferson because I'm reading the way he harshly described black, white inferior yeah, differences and really black inferiority. And he talked about how black people smell different, how, you know, should be treated like children, have inferior lungs. At the same time, he had a black family. He had family members that were African-American, of African descent. And so I think it's hard to assess him, although there are so many wonderful things about Thomas Jefferson, his writing, his conceptualizing of the Constitution. It's hard to vibe it also with the idea that he mortgaged um, human beings to build his estate. I ask about it because in some ways that's the broader context of this project, which is how do we assess not just pointing blame, not just being accusatory, but how do we assess American history with slavery as a central theme? 
I think it's hard to read some of the stuff that happened to our ancestors. I found it hard. Some of us um, that were writers on it were crying around some of the stuff we learned. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to think that this happened to our ancestors. And then, you know, people say about my own work that, oh, why do you talk so much about race? Why? Slavery is over. I wasn't involved in that. And I think this piece, while not casting blame on individuals now, ask you to think about slavery as foundational in our country and not forget it and, in fact, learn about it. So teach children about it. Teach, in, te teach this in a fuller way than it has been taught in the past. When you say it's foundational, explain what you mean by that. So if you look at, I mean, I looked at medicine, but you also look at wealth. So um, <laughs> even in today's world, there are people who say, they look at black communities and they say, oh, look, your communities are so terrible, they're so dirty, there's rats, there's mm -hmm. crime. And it's sort of like, well, A, that's not largely true, but B, if black communities are suffering, go back, all the way back, and see, oh, when slavery ended, there was mass discrimination, obviously forced labor with enslaved people, and then it didn't just end. These laws continued, laws continued, redlining, all of these issues. So it's no wonder that, um, you know, some black communities are in hard times. One of the most painful parts for me, being from the state of Louisiana, was the sugar part and how the prevention of African Americans who had been freed from becoming landowners in the sugar industry, which could have been a wealth building thing. I think that that piece is really important and interesting because it re reframes a bit sugar, because we think of cotton as king, mm -hmm. but really sugar is queen. Mm -hmm. um, and so the sugar industry made so many millionaires out of, especially in Louisiana. And then black people were denied the right to the rights to uh, um, gain from it. And even currently, there aren't a lot of black people who are you know, uh, I guess, business owners in the sugar area where they're really successful. At the same time, sugar was really harsh. So that, you know, the enslaved people were working really hard under extremely dangerous conditions. Children were working in sugar factories. And so, again, that was, and that was a part of industry at the time. So if oil made the 1900s rich, then sugar and cotton made the 1800s rich. Yet, Black people largely aren't the beneficiaries of it now, and it's also harmful to us because sugar has a huge impact on our health. Yeah, that was something that was a great resonance to me, that you talk about the slavery and sugar plantations, and now even the sugar industry in some ways is disproportionate in its effect on African American and health. And its negative effects on African American health. That's what I like about this package, that it puts things together that you don't necessarily think of. So you're thinking of sugar, wealth building, slavery, and then it goes back to also health. And so I like that the, the pieces fit together. One of the themes of this project is the lingering impact of slavery in ways that we probably don't think about on an hour-by-hour -hour basis in our day. Give me an example of that in health. I think the one that strikes me most is in pain management. and so. Back in slave times, there were doctors who believed that blacks had a superpower against pain, so extremely high pain tolerance. So that has lingered in current medical practice, so that a 2016 study of doctors and residents found that um, residents and doctors, when asked about different kinds of pain, so if you get your hand slammed in a door or if you break your ankle, then what is the level of pain? And they believed that black people had a less sensitivity to that, those kinds of pain than white people. And so that affects the way people are treated and their pain is managed. It also makes black people feel that, oh, we have to be really strong against pain. We do have this superpower. So it makes you minimize your own pain sometimes if you're an African-American because you're supposed to be strong. That is the myth. Or it makes you avoid the healthcare system because you know it's going to hurt because you're not going to get proper pain management. So that is one that comes from those days when a high tolerance of pain was a myth that was in the in society and in the air in order to justify beating people and working them extremely hard. 
one of the pieces that struck me about how we today still have the reverberations from things that were from a long time ago is traffic in the city of Atlanta. Explain that to me. I really liked that piece. It was very interesting because the highways in Atlanta were made so that they could purposely get rid of African-American communities. And so they were put through the communities so that they could get rid of them. And also often to hem in black communities and avoid them. So it, the, the highways that are present today that are causing a lot of traffic came from the segregationist idea that um, communities should be either removed, black communities, or separate. And so people on Twitter and in conversation are saying, oh, that's why my traffic is so bad, because traffic is horrific often in Atlanta. And so if that is a remnant of segregation, then we need to look at, you know, other ways that slavery, um, segregation, and these kinds of um, institutions affected our current system. One of the things that this series does is reimagine American history. But to me, it also reimagines what journalism could be. Was that a conscious effort to sort of say, let's expand the bounds of what a journalistic project is? I think that is exactly right. And it's part of what I'm most proud of. I'm also extremely proud that so many of us are black journalists because sometimes our contributions don't get as celebrated as they should. And so um, it's really wonderful to have so many black journalists contributing to this to allow us also to delve into some of the issues that we really care about. Um, for me, it allowed me to sort of prove the things I've been saying in my other articles that are about issues, um, public health in present day, and to go back and trace them. This project was a way to say, no, we really care about this issue. We want to make it high quality and really look back, improve everything, because I get a lot of pushback when I am writing about race. And so I have to prove every single thing. I have two fact checkers that work with me on all my stories. So um, to put rigorous journalism behind um, the history is really important. Dean Baquet, the African-American editor of The New York Times, uh, had a town hall meeting in which he was talking about Trump, but he was also talking about race, et cetera. And he said, we have to refocus a bit and do things like this. But people say, OK, The New York Times is doing this as a way to pivot away from the Mueller investigation and to attack Trump as racist. That seemed weird, since this has obviously been in the works for a year or so. But explain that uh, sort of criticism and how you rebut that. I think it's hard to talk about race, because when you talk about race, people immediately think you're calling them racist. And so even looking back, tracing, getting all journalists, artists um, to discuss this in a very robust, rigorous, journalistic way makes people defensive. <clears throat> And so this is a way to say, for me, in my work, I don't assign blame. I write about medicine. I'm not saying, oh, doctors, you're all very racist. I'm saying the system is in unequal and it needs to be changed. And so I think that's what this project is saying, too, is to say the first step is admitting that many of the current day structures are based on this 400-year legacy and 250 years of slavery and another 100 years of government-mandated segregation. And so it's asking and really using journal, rigorous journalistic um, practices and delving into history to say, this is how to think of our country now and to acknowledge the, the um, contributions of enslaved people and to really say it's the legacy remains. So I think that's what we want to do. There are very few white writers or artists involved in this project. In fact, almost none. How conscious was that, and did you debate that? I think it was not intentional to exclude white writers, but it was, an intentional, it was intentional to hold up, lift up the work of black writers, to show that the, the sort of energy, the importance of black journalists. And, and artists and photographers. Um, so that was very intentional. 
I don't know how much, if it received any pushback. I just know that it was really wonderful to see in the contributors page. We were calling it the blackest contributors page ever in the New York Times Magazine because our pictures were there, which mm. was important to show who we are and that we exist. You say it wasn't supposed to be accusatory. In other words, you don't want people to feel defensive. But you do want people to feel uncomfortable, right? Because it's a pretty... It, it causes discomfort reading this series. I think the discomfort is in the honesty and in the pain that our country was built on. And so if you didn't show that, you don't understand the full scope. I found it hard. I found it, you know, upsetting. But on the other hand, I'd rather have the reality and show it so that people understand that this, you know, our country didn't just become this way by magic. Um, this was built on the backs of human beings. In this period where there's been a resurgence of toxic racism and permission for people to say racist things, how is this series, how is this project going to serve as an antidote to that? I think one of the ways it does it is to give people on the other side of this some ammunition to um, fight back with and to use facts and to use history to really push back against some of the ideas that are being talk, discussed. And um, what Nicole Hannah-Jones says in her opening essay is that black people have an intense belief in our democracy, that we believe in the structures of the United States, despite being the victims of it. And so I really like that idea that, you know, we're the ones who believe in sort of the, so, the, the um, social safety nets. We believe in um, letting refugees in more than other people because we have been in this country for so long, longer than many of other, many other people, and that we have um, we built the structures of our current democracy. Linda, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. It. Good to have you.